what has happened to the Scottish independence campaign? In the late 1990s and in the early noughties, all we saw in the newspapers regularly, time after time, were stories about the Scottish National Party, about the eventual establishment of an assembly and about a referendum that narrowly failed. And since then, there seems to be less and less within the media and within political discourse about Scottish independence, which only a few years ago seemed to be a sure thing. I'm joined today by three uh, individuals who've been staunch members of the Scottish independence campaign from the beginning. I'm joined firstly by Roger McLeod, who uh, was a former member of the SNP and a key driver of the independence movement for a long time. And he also is the host of a very popular independence programme that goes out at least twice a week uh, through a Scottish prism. And you can get that on X, on YouTube and all the usual channels. I'm also joined by Eva Comrie, an independent candidate for independence, uh, in Scotland. She's running in the Westminster elections that are upcoming and she has a lot to say about the history of the Scottish independent campaign, how it's and why it's gone quiet and what needs to be done to revitalise it and to get Scottish independence. And finally, I'm joined by Lloyd Quinnan. He's a former uh, SN he member of the Scottish Assembly, just to get that right, because uh, there's a couple of different bodies involved. He's a f former member of the Scottish Assembly. And again, Lloyd, although he's a member of the SNP, he's probably uh, a thorn in the side of that organisation as he's highly critical of where it's or where it's gone and what it has become over the last few years. Guys, thanks for joining me. Oh, You're thank welcome. you. Yeah. What happened, guys, to the Scottish independence campaign and the SNP? I remember 15 years ago, it was so full of life. It was it was kicking off. It achieved an assembly. It achieved a referendum. And it just seems to have petered out. We've seen two of the leaders of the SNP arrested and accused of various crimes and their political careers destroyed to a large degree. What happened to the SNP? What happened to that Scottish independent campaign? Can I start off with Lloyd Quinnan, if you don't mind? Sure, Flinbar. I, I think the the, it, the the central issue, I think, is that the SNP was not as prepared for devolution as they thought they were. They went into the Scottish Parliament and instead of, as some of us would have campaigned for, to use it as a platform to... To, to effectively campaign for independence within a devolved administration, it was decided pretty early on that what we would do is we would go along with the rules as, as laid out by the British. Um, that was a successful strategy up to a point in as much as by the third election to the Scottish Parliament, the SNP were the government, something which you know was, was, was astounding because it goes against the actual voting system that we have. No party was ever supposed to be able to gain an absolute majority because it's a mixture of first past the post and a list top-up system based on a modification of the, the Belgian de Haunt system. So the SIP gets into government, delivers on major infrastructure policies, delivers on a, a, a number of issues which we're beginning to address directly, the, the central issues of our, of our country, which is primarily poverty, uh, because of that good governance, it was then possible for the Scottish National Party to move to having the referendum that we had in 2014 with the agreement of the UK government. And I think subsequent to that, the ramifications of us coming within 5% of becoming an independent country, I think was unexpected by the British. It was unexpected by the European Union. And also because of our geographical position, and you in Ireland will understand this, it was a bit of a shock to NATO and all its members as well. And it's fairly clear that since then, there have been, I would suggest, moves and manoeuvres on behalf of those three power blocks to diminish the power of the Scottish National Party, diminish the power of the independence movement. And unfortunately, it would appear that uh, certain leading members of the Scottish National Party have been party to that emasculation, effectively, of, of the movement. I think the issue of the two leaders is, are quite separate things. The, the first leader that you were talking about is Alex Salmond, who actually delivered the referendum. Um, and within a very short period, well, immediately after the referendum, he chose to resign. I believe 
there were then manoeuvres made involving certain members of the Scottish National Party, indeed the Scottish Government, to besmirch his name. Uh, an inquiry was held. It led to a court case. He won the court case. That There was then a second court case, again, which, which he won. And effectively, yes, he's a leader of the party. Yes, to some degree, his, uh, his reputation and his, his, his political standing has been damaged. But the difference between him and the first leader is he's an innocent man. And sometimes, particularly our media, and indeed some members of the Scottish National Party, forget that he is an innocent man. And he's As now to the second, leader of the Alba Party, is that right? Yes, he, he, he became the leader of the Alba Party, but the Alba Party wasn't started by Alex Salmond. It was started by uh, some disaffected activists from the Scottish National Party who then asked him, him to join, I believe. I believe that's my understanding of it. The second leader, Nicola Sturgeon, who took over immediately after Alec resigned after the referendum, um, has been, yes, uh, has been arrested and has been uh, questioned by the police on issues of fraud. Uh, relating to monies that were collected by the Scottish National Party on behalf of the movement to deliver a second referendum. And that money seems to have just disappeared into thin air. Unlikely it ended up in the pockets of the, 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 the former leader, Nicola Sturgeon, but certainly it disappeared into the coffers of the SNP and has disappeared into the mists of time. As yet, the police inquiry, which is called Operation Branch Form, has not as yet come to a conclusion. And uh, our system being markedly different from yours, the police are carrying out the investigation. They will then submit their report to the Procurator Fiscal Service, who makes the decision on whether or not there is a case to answer. But that still hasn't happened. So the jury, literally, is still out on the second case. But as far as the case of Alex Hammond is concerned, he was entirely exonerated. Roddy, do you have anything to add to that contemporary history of of, of not just Scottish independence movement itself, but the SNP? Well, I wouldn't dare question my dear friend Lloyd, but, um, the, the, yeah, well, there was, I mean, I, I, I joined the SNP back in the, the late 1960s and, uh, and, uh, and right through up until 2020, I was a member of the SNP. Um, and I, I re recall when the devolution uh, was starting to be, discussed and debated within the party. I was one of those dissidents that didn't want anything to do with devolution. I thought it was um, I thought it was a British trap. I have since been proved right, I think. Mm -hmm. um, but I didn't want part of it. And uh, but we were voted down Democrat. It was actually Alec um, Silver Tongue Salmond who convinced myself and others that it was the way to go. And he did make a great job of it. And when we did get in power the first time in, in 2007 in a minority government, as, as Lloyd said, the, the voting system was rigged so that actually so that the, the unionists, uh, the, the Liberal Party and the Labour Party would always control uh, Holyrood. That was the plan. I mean, there was no doubt about it. So we we, we burst that, that, that balloon, the unionist balloon, and it, with a minority government, it did tremendous things. And then went on to 2011 when it got an outright majority, which is almost impossible to do with the system that we have, but they got it. And he made a great job of it, and they made a great job of devolution, um, and they got uh, the people got behind it, believed it, and we got very close. And then, then he the day after the referendum, he resigned. Nicola Sturgeon took over, and I'm going to say it here and now, she um, destroyed the movement. She has she was given mandate after mandate. She was given 56 out of 59 MPs down at Westminster in 2015 that said it wasn't a vote for independence. She said the same again in 2017, and we lost about 20 seats. She never once um, got it close to us having either a, an independence referendum or a plebiscite. Um, she helped dismantle. The greatest thing that happened during the, the, the 2014 referendum was the Yes movement, where the grassroots of the Scottish independence movement, they, they, they moved everything, and it was the politicians were chasing it after the Yes movement. They, they were they were left way behind. So when she took over, she had obviously made up her mind that she wasn't going to have that. And she single-handedly almost, with the help of her, her goons, as I would call them, destroyed the Yes movement. The grassroots movement was finished. And so we haven't now, since 2014, we've not moved forward one inch. Would There's now more sure? splinter groups uh, within the, within the organisation. We've got all sorts of splinter groups. We need unity. Um, and there are a few people working on that. 
Would it be adequate to describe her as the Keir Starmer of the Scottish independent movement of the, or the SNP? Just That's what just comes to mind. In I, I think of what happened to Corbyn, how they built up the movement, the momentum movement, and how that was uh, went to the wayside to a large degree. You had the Yes movement. I'm not talking about the politics in it, but just the modular changes that occurred. Uh, there seems to be similarities. Um, there. I would call her more of a Marshall Patan, actually. Um, okay. That would be a better, more accurate description from me. Although I am hardcore, I must admit. I can, I, I can tell that. Eva, um, do you want to add anything or reiterating, uh, reiterate anything in terms of just the histrionics uh, up until where we're at at the moment? What I would do, Finn Barris, I would go back in time a little bit um, because I think it's really important that people know that Winnie Ewing famous though she was, was not the first elected politician from the SNP. The first oh, MP oh, that oh. the SNP had was Dr Robert McIntyre, who was elected in, I think, April 1945. So you can see that the electoral success of the SNP actually goes much further back in time than people might recall. Um, my own family campaigned for Dr McIntyre in the 1940s, uh, but I've been involved with the movement since the 1960s. Um, I was an SNP councillor in the 1990s, and in 2021, I was the top candidate on the list for Mid Scotland and Fife for the Scottish parliamentary election for Holyrood for the SNP, and left at that point to join the Alba Party because I was attracted to the notion that we could vote SNP for constituency seats, we could vote Alba for list seats, and had that process been followed by true independent supporters, and had it been supported by the SNP, nobody is in any doubt but that there would have then been what we call a supermajority of the Scottish Parliament elected as independents supporting MSPs. And that supermajority would have given the Scottish Parliament the opportunity to then talk in terms of holding another referendum or negotiating with Westminster in respect of further steps towards Scottish independence. That didn't happen because the SNP set their face, and this is Nicola Sturgeon responsible for this, she set her face absolutely against any kind of deals with the Alba party to the great detriment of our country. Because yeah, yeah. What we knew then is what we know now, that the majority of the people of Scotland desire independence. The desire for independence is the democratic will of the people. The stumbling block is what the SNP has descended into, what it's become. So what I watched evolve, um, particularly over the 80s and 90s, was that the SNP went from being a party which had really hit skid row after the 70s when they'd had seven MPs and then 11 MPs in Westminster, and then they were reduced to just a couple. So the late 70s and the 80s were, were not happy times within either the movement or the SNP. But come the 90s, people like me were beginning to make a bit of headway and become elected as local authority councillors and able to build the reputation of the party for actually being competent. So when it came to Alex Salmond's government in 2007, he's a, a minority administration, 2011, um, as Lloyd said, he managed to become a majority administration with the most competent government that Scotland has had in modern times. And a lot mm -hmm. of the measures that were introduced then remain popular now. And it was his competence and the government that he led that meant that we ran the unionists so close in the referendum in 2014. But between then and now, what the SNP have absolutely done, and I don't think there's any doubt about this, they have utterly failed to prioritise independence, which is supposed to be their raison d'etre. They've had mandate after mandate um, supportive of independence in every Westminster and Holyrood election, and they've implemented absolutely nothing. In, why, I think, January 2020, that? on Brexit Day, Nicola Sturgeon promised that there would be a constitutional convention. Here we are, more than four years later, and this SNP are still promising that there will be a constitutional convention which they will arrange, they will create after the Westminster general election. It makes no sense. But why there Why do you think this has happened, Eva, that you, you went to such heights and then to, to plummet so fast and so far? Right. Not in terms of the public opinion, which is clear the polls are in favour, but just in terms of political 
positive movement towards independence, especially within the SNP. Why is this happened? Is, is this just some organic thing that has happened or do you think there's something else behind it? No, I think to begin with in 2014, because the referendum had just taken place, I think Nicola Sturgeon inherited a party that she expected to be able to comfortably manage for a few years because what she did not anticipate was that the Brexit vote would turn out the way it did. She thought Scotland would remain in the EU, but the vote went the other way and she then had to start to talk about fulfilling her promise, which was Scotland will not be dragged out of the EU against its will. So she came under pressure to do something and she didn't have the bottle or the imagination or the vision to actually do what she promised, which was do something about independence. She became lazy, she lacked vision, and I think sometime after that, she turned and her attention went away completely from the independence question onto all the other madcap policies, including all the identity policies. Um, and unfortunately, she had succeeded between 2014 and her retired or resignation last year, she'd succeeded in surrounding herself by people who are not fit to be part of the Scottish Cabinet. They are not intelligent enough, knowledgeable enough, or experienced enough to have a hand in running this country. So it meant that when she stood down, there were actually not any particularly obvious, skilled, talented successors. Um, and we had the embarrassment of that leadership election last year, where the, the collective abilities of the three candidates were very much in doubt. And obviously Hamza Yusuf won, and he has proven himself to be an even worse operator than anyone anticipated. Mm. So I think part of this has been accidental, and part of it has been by design, because the movement remains alive and vibrant at grassroots level. But when you speak to um, party political activists, Many are absolutely disillusioned that they've had a series of mandates, as we said, and promises made by the SNP who have not backed them up, they've not delivered, and they're still not delivering, because what they're saying for the general election campaign is, trust the SNP with their vote, and if Labour get in, Hamza Yusuf's going to ask Keir Starmer for consent to hold another referendum, when Starmer is never going to agree to hold another referendum, it won't happen unless the British think that the people of Scotland are going to vote no um, to the question of independence. So there is no coherent strategy from the SNP at all in relation to how to attain independence. What they're doing instead is talking about all the other stuff that they want to do, you know, hold Westminster, speak to the fire, stand up for Scotland in Westminster, hold the unionists accountable. General platitudes. Not achieving that. anything. Lloyd, um, and Finbar, could I just say, if, for your audience, it would be great if they would think about uh, comparing it to the Irish Parliamentary Party of 1918. Our SNP MPs and MSPs settled down into the British way. They tried to fight it on the British rules. And that's how, how you can never win. You never win if you're fighting on the British rules. The home, the home rule, quite often people like to compare it to more modern things that have happened in the north of Ireland. And the occupied six counties. But in reality, for me, and obviously for you, Roddy, this is more about, the, they've become the home rule movement, where mm -hmm. they want to stay connected to Britain, uh, act out in their British ways, as it were, what in Ireland sometimes is referred to as wet Brit West British. No, just for a wee second, uh, and I don't, I don't want to overly focus on the SNP anymore, other than you are a member, so I'll give you the final shout on it. <clears throat> Eva has suggested that a lot of this has come down to one or two personalities whether it was Nicola Sturgeon, whether it was uh, Hamza Yusa, that these two personalities were lazy, were made bad decisions. Um, are you uh, okay with that descriptor of how SNP yes, got yeah, to where I, I, I would I would go slightly further, Finbar. But I mean, I knew Nicola Sturgeon very well. Um, and she is someone who has a great deal of confidence in herself but doesn't have the same confidence in her abilities, if you understand what I mean, yeah. So people who are like that tend to surround themselves with people who are absolutely no threat on an intellectual or an emotional level or any threat whatsoever. Effectively, immediately Alex stood down and, and, and Nicola moved to concentrate her power. She made alterations to the, 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 the party constitution, but also 
she created a structure within the party that meant ultimately her or her husband had the final say on who was candidate at any level, be it from council to the Scottish Parliament to the Westminster Parliament. That led to effectively a despotism over nine years, you know, where you were either in the gang or you were out the gang. It also meant that they developed a real kind of uh, bunker mentality verging on a paranoia. Any criticism was, uh, it was evil unionist propaganda, when in reality, most criticisms were because they weren't being very competent as a government. I think in a broader sense, there are there are a number of individuals who have been who hang around and had senior positions in the party uh, through the mid to late 90s, whose influence was quite large. And I would suggest, and I'm not the only one who thinks it, that their influence was there on the behalf of others. And again, this comes down to the, the, the central analysis that needs to be done by any national liberation movement. You have to understand who what and where your adversaries are. And unfortunately, because the SNP has always believed itself to be a constitutional but revolutionary party, it operates entirely within the British rules and therefore doesn't really see Britain as an adversary in the manner in which, say, the Irish would or the, the Kenyans or the Ugandans or, or, or anyone seeking to remove themselves from the, the colonial structure. Being good boys and girls and working within the British system meant that there was no analysis properly of either Scotland's economic position in the world, our strategic position vis-a-vis -vis NATO and the UK, and a proper understanding, too, of when, when you threaten the United Kingdom from within. The United Kingdom has a huge number of friends across the world, and it's an important part of NATO. Uh, we, we, you know, you'll know geographically the pressure that that the Irish government is coming under to 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 move towards a pro NATO position. Now we're already in that position. You know, Scotland comes out of the United Kingdom that weakens the United Kingdom and and de facto weakens the NATO alliance. There are an awful lot of people who don't want that to happen, and they're not all British. I think the failure to analyse properly our position vis a vis the international politics as well as the domestic politics led the SNP to attract people of minimum imagination and some who in real terms are devolutionists, but you don't get on in the SNP by beating the drum for devolution. So it has to be done by stealth and effectively the changes to the constitution, the lack of focus on independence, the failure to engage with international organizations is all part of a defocusing that I believe comes from certain individuals who are not really the servants of the Scottish people in what they should be. Conflict avoiders and careerists and things like that. Roddy, hmm. you appear on my doorstep and you want to sell me Scottish independence. Well, I, the, there's several things you could say. I mean, the unionists always try and talk about how money, but it's not about money. It's about democracy. The, Scotland hasn't voted for the Tories, for example, since 1955, and they weren't real Tories. There were some Liberal Conservatives included in that majority. Yet we've had Tory governments left, right and centre. We get the government that England elects for us. Why would you do that? And, and I was, we were doing a podcast today, and I'm going to steal some of uh, Lloyd's stuff, and it goes back to what we used to do in, in, back in the, the, the early days. As we used to say to people on the doorstep, well, you know, when you get your pay poke on a Thursday, would you hand it to your neighbour for your neighbour to tell you how to spend it and what you needed to buy and where you could go for your holidays and what kind of car you could have? And of course the answer is no to that. But that's what we do as a nation. I, 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 and I highlighted in our programme last week, out of the 100% the of the, the UK budget next year, Scotland's going to get 3.5% spent on it, whereas there's 8.9% of the population. Well, it doesn't take a genius to work that out. And it's certainly this, do you think, that this is a government in England who will sell anything that's not nailed down, anything that can't make a profit, they close down. They pay the lowest pensions in the developed world, the worst welfare payments in the developed world, yet we are supposed to believe that the English keep us in the union so they can subsidise us by billions every year. They certainly don't keep us for our charm um, or our love of them. So it, just if you add a bit of logic, the reason they keep us is because we subsidise them. We know that. 
we subsidise them. They don't subsidise us. So, Roddy, there's the financials. And Lloyd had said earlier that because of the focus of the SNP on personal career development within the leadership, uh, engaging in, in major infrastructural projects at times, but not focusing on their key principle, that the analytical economic work and, and the analytics that have to be done and the planning and policy that has to be created for a properly independent Scotland has not been worked on. Um, but there must be some kind of reported and data out there that indicates whether Scotland would be better off or not outside of the British arrangement? Well, it's very hard to find because you've got to remember that you know one of the things they didn't devolve to Scotland was broadcasting. So we, you know, and the reason for our programme through a Scottish prism, because it, it takes something like that for us to get a Scottish viewpoint. So we get the London viewpoint, you know, put into the homes every day of the week. The newspapers are all English, Anglo-centric, anti-independence. We don't have a pro-independence. There's meant to be one, but it's not really. It's part of a, a stable of unionist papers. There is no such thing as a pro-independence uh, media. There's not pro-independence radio. There's not pro-independence television. So it's all done by word of mouth and by by internet and by articles that we can produce. And of course, when it, you know, it doesn't get into the mainstream. And the, the, the average, the non-political anorak, if that lady from the BBC doesn't say it's true, it's not true. And, and that's what we're, we're fighting against. So we, the where, where our independence will be won is on the street and on the door. But for the last 15 months, every opinion poll that comes out shows that Scotland, the majority of Scots want independence. There's just not the political will. There is not the political leadership. And that's why there's like, for example, a new group come out called Independence for Indy First, who are finding that people like Eva, Independence for Independence, because the people are losing faith in the political parties, all of them, and have decided to take matters into their own hands. And that's what we've got to do. Before we look at, at current and future developments in terms of campaigns outside of the SNP, uh, Eva, selling points. Sell me Scottish independence. Uh, the, the Scottish guy... independence, right. Well, it's not just about the economic or the financial argument. It's about national pride, and it's especially about priorities, um, because particularly, as Lloyd mentioned earlier, the biggest problem for Scotland and, and the issue that Alex Salmond's governments particularly were able to begin to address is poverty. It's poverty and inequality. And, you know, the Scots are quite like the Irish. Scots have emigrated worldwide and built the world. If we can build the world um, and all these different institutions and you know all different sorts of architecture that Scots have been responsible for elsewhere, then I'm damn sure we can build our own country. But where we are constantly held back is that Scotland's resources, in essence, bankroll Westminster. I'm old enough to remember when North Sea oil was discovered and I remember very distinctly a particular Hogmanay, a New Year celebration uh, in a caravan we lived in in Creef in Perthshire then, with my mum and my dad and all their friends celebrating because all they could think about was the likes of Dallas and Stetsons and Diamonds and, you know, Scotland was going to be the land of milk and honey because we had discovered oil. And instead of that, what did we get? We got weapons of mass destruction on the Clyde that the majority of the people of Scotland abhor and want rid of. Our money has gone south to build Westminster, Canary Wharf, infrastructure in England, road and rail systems in England that do nothing for the people of Scotland. We don't even have the ability to travel in a ferry from Scotland to mainland Europe, and that is unacceptable. What is also happening is, and, and you know this, there's great talk that the oil refinery in Grangemouth, the only oil refinery in Scotland, will close. It needs repaired, it needs replaced. If it closes, Scotland's oil will go down south to be refined and sent back north again. That's deindustrialisation on a massive scale, similar to and a continuation of what Thatcher was responsible for in the 1980s. So the question is not actually with respect, sell me independence. The question is, tell me what there is that the union does for Scotland, because the cost of the union right now is... Fuel crisis, fuel poverty, cost of living crisis. And I think Lloyd had said that 
approximately one in four of the people of Scotland now live in poverty. I suspect that it's a lot higher than that in many areas. Where I am in Clackmannanshire, it is certainly up to 40% in some places. And that's us in a position where we, as the smallest mainland local authority, have an awful lot going for us, but we don't have control of our Scottish resources to enable us to put our money where our mouths are because we're spending money on the wrong things. If Scotland was able to control its own budget and create the Scotland we want it to be, we would have a country where people thrive. At the moment, what we have are people that are using savings and cashing in pensions because they're waiting far too long on NHS waiting lists to get life-changing operations, whether it's artificial knees or hips or cataract operations or the like. Now, people that have worked all their lives, that have paid income tax and national insurance, ought not these days to have to borrow from pension funds for operations that they need. But that's happening because the NHS is not appropriately managed and funded in a Scotland which is simply devolved. We have difficulties, for example, in relation to education, because the Scottish Government introduced a policy to do with teachers that are just newly qualified leaving university get the first jobs and their first year salary is paid by the government. It means that teachers who are longer qualified and more experienced aren't getting jobs. So they then are not able to borrow mortgages, for example, and there's a lot of insecurity around that. And much of this stems from the fact that the Scottish Parliament in Holyrood is really very little more at the moment than a glorified local authority. Yeah. Dependent on Westminster in the main for its income and in no position whatsoever to argue for how to take control of its own resources. But we get shot of Westminster, it means we get shot of weapons of mass destruction and that budget is no longer ours to worry about and that on its own makes a massive difference. But if so we've it, got... It sounds to me like there's more than just the concept of Scottish independence uh, being sought here. In, in Ireland, in the Irish Republic, we, we have allegedly, we've got independence. We got control of our own natural resources. We produce oil, we produce gas, we produce many minerals, but it's all in the hands of private companies. And in fact, we subsidize them to find the stuff in the ground and then to take it out. So what seems to be coming with yourself, Eva, I'm not sure about the SNP. It doesn't sound like it. And I wonder what Roddy's position in this as well is the last of three of his. There's more than Scottish independence at stake here, is there? This is about is this about nationalising or in some way taking control of the natural resources and keeping out of keeping them out of the control of international conglomerates. Uh, Eva, you, you can kick off with that first. Aye. We we need to have a national house building company because there are record numbers of homeless people in Scotland and that's unnecessary. National house building company, we must have a national energy company. You've probably heard that there was a reverse wind auction recently in Scotland where the government sold off wind licences, but instead of having a proper bidding system where they sold to the highest bidder, they did it the other way about, where there were, were um, maximum amounts that they would take rather than minimum amounts. So we need a bit more responsibility and fiscal accountability in government than we've got just now. But we need in Scotland a massive programme which is social justice because there are, as we've said already, poverty, inequality issues, there are issues surrounding education, access to education. And what needs to happen is we need a responsible government that is actually in tune with the needs of the people. And that's not what we've got just now because we have an, a concentration on policies that are neither popular nor populist and their niche politics and their diversions away from the big picture. Because the big picture should be the benefits of independence and how do we get to an independent state and then we can start to turn the country into turn it around which is what it desperately needs and will not get in terms of the union before i go to lloyd on on, on that qu question uh, is there an obvious distinction or difference between quality of life in england and scotland in terms of poverty in terms of housing i'm just wondering are they bad all over or is scotland worse some statistics in Scotland are far worse. I mean, the most obvious one is to do with drugs deaths and addiction. And there are issues in relation to alcohol too. So some of that's really pretty awful and it is worse. There will be arguments about the way that statistics are calculated and the basis of calculation, but it is worse. Um, and yeah, the further north that you get, you know, the further away you get from London, the worse these things get. So yeah, there is a difference. That's not to say that there's not 
hellish experiences in England too, because there definitely are, no doubt about that. Um, but I think that if if Scotland were independent and decisions were made in Scotland by Scotland for Scotland, we could see improvements pretty quickly, um, provided that social justice is is required to be delivered. Lloyd, in terms of Scotland's resources, both its social capital, but its mineral resources, its fuel and energy resources, would you advocate for it to be nationalised? I'm not sure what the position of the SNP itself is. It doesn't seem to be. But would you advocate for the nationalisation of key industries in Scotland that are not... Currently- Absolutely. I, 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 I don't believe that you can become a, a, a newly independent state and not take all your natural resources into the big pot for the people. The purpose of independence is for us to 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 deliver on on the issues that have not been delivered by the union. The union deliberately keeps, you know, a, a certain section of the population, be they Welsh, English, or Northern Irish, keeps them in a in a in a position of subservience. We don't need to be that person. We don't need to be those people anymore. The simple fact of the matter is that. You know, you, you were asking the others, you know, sell me independence. Well, Scotland will be a good neighbour in the world. We're not interested in conquest. We have no history of conquest of any kind whatsoever, except wearing the red coat of the British Army. We have no interest in taking over other people's countries. We have no interest in telling other people what to do. What we have got an interest in, though, is reconnecting with all those thousands, if not millions of people whose forebears left our shores to go to other places and develop proper international networks based on uh, respect and, 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 and certain mutually cultural cultural connections. And, but the, the, the other thing that is, is really important here is oil was discovered in the North Sea by Norway and the United Kingdom at exactly the same point. Norway is approximately within half a million the same size as, as Scotland. Outside of the oil, Norway doesn't have the other natural resources that, that we have. But what Norway has, it has a, a sovereign wealth fund that will protect its population and its people into the next two centuries because of the manner in which they've they've used it. They have a, an, a health and an education system that is the you know, the envy envy of the world. Now, we could be that country. But the more important part of Norway's, you know, newfound wealth is the manner in which they've applied it. You know, during this period of the, the, the horrendous war that's been carried out against the Palestinian people, people have been reminded about the, the Oslo Accords. Norway operated across the world as a peacemaker and still does. And I believe that that's exactly what we would want Scotland to do. Certainly, all opinion polls about our young people. Our young people are not interested in conflict and war in other places. They're interested in peace and active in, in favour of peace. Scotland's potential contribution to the world is enormous. It really is. But we have to begin with owning, possessing, controlling and exploiting our own natural resources you know, for ourselves so that we can build the country to the point that it should be at. At the moment, it, it, you know, we have no motorway north of the central belt. We have, you know, very few uh, bridge or tunnel interconnections between the 300 and odd islands that we have off our coast. An independent Scotland would see Scotland from its periphery to the centre which is the very opposite of the way in which Britain operates, which is to see the centre and work out the way. The whole focus of, 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 of this, the national movement is to provide exactly the same level of service and ability to access service, whether or not you live in an island 150 miles off the coast or whether or not you live in the centre of the capital city. That has to be the driver. It's all about improving in every possible way, the lives of all our people to make up for the 300 years where that opportunity has been removed from them by the British state and the Treaty of Union that we locked into. Roddy, do you have anything to add in terms of natural resources, sovereignty, self-control, things like that? Well, I, I should I should put a carrot on. I'm, I'm an old lefty, so yeah, I would 
I would nationalise most things, but although I, I do believe that we should be like, like, like Norway from the point of view they've got stat oil. You can't nationalise all the oil in the North Sea, but you can't you can have your own oil, your own national energy company, which can then go in and compete um, in the marketplace as stat oil does and does very well. In fact, stat oil owns a lot of the, the, the fuels in Scotland, which is you know just quite 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 ludicrous. Um, um, I would certainly, all the utilities which we've sold off, I, I made a comment earlier today that uh, my lo I live in Catalonia and our local electricity company owns the SSEB in Scotland, the south of Scotland, the electricity board as we call it. And they boast in their, 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 the stuff they send us that they can keep electricity prices here in Catalonia at a decent level because their foreign investments, e.g. the SSEB, are paying off. Whereas my, my friends and colleagues and family in Scotland are paying through the nose for their energy. And yet Scotland is so energy rich. We export 28% 20, of England's energy comes from Scotland. 100% of its oil comes from Scotland, but 28% of its electricity comes from Scotland. And we get nothing for it. Nothing. We get Ireland nothing for our oil. We get a few pennies thrown back at us. Ireland is so, in a similar yeah. position in that we get very little tax return. And again, it's all private companies who, in, in in the model of it, they're supposed to be just extracting it. Uh, we have a choice. We can tax them more if we want to, but our, our successive governments have chosen not to. And at one point, Norway and Norwegian companies until recently owned a far bigger fraction of the uh, oil and gas coming from the Atlantic coast in Ireland than the Irish people did themselves. So it seems to be the same all over. But I just, I just wanted to know your positions on conglomerates on privatization, on nationalization, things like that to give people a flavor of, because you you know, I think it was a James Conley said, you can change, you can take the Union Jack off the off the parliament buildings and you can put up the tricolor in the Irish case. But if you don't change what's happening underneath those flags, then what, what what's the point in having the revolution in the first place? In terms of where things are at now, I've noticed a lot of the corporate media are suggesting that parties like ALBA independence running for independence, those developments actually take away and split the vote and split the, somehow split the independence nationalist vote. I don't know how, because it, that just forces them to work with you if you get elected, you know. But um, Eva, you're running in the elections. What do you say or how do you answer accusations that you're splitting the vote, you're reducing the potential for independence? Right, well, as we've said already, my MP that I'm standing against is John Nicholson and he's, he's SNP. But I would contend that he's not actually a supporter of Scottish independence because he was elected in 2019 and between then and now he's done absolutely nothing to move the dial on Scottish independence at all. His interests, his speeches, his broadcasts are all about everything other than independence. So I'm not splitting an independence vote because he's not an independence proponent. Um, it may be that there are other independence candidates who stand against me, and that's absolutely fine, because where my selling point lies is not only am I an independent for independence, I live and work in this constituency and have done for most of my life. The home I live in is 200 yards round the corner from the house where my dad was born in 1935. So Clackmannanshire, the smallest county in the mainland, has been my home. My son went to school in the town where we live. And I know the neighbours, friends, relatives, etc., around here, and I know the area literally like the back of my hand. So people wouldn't just be getting a candidate who wants independence. They're getting a local whose entire life has been lived in this area, and which is very, very important to me personally. But a similar position applies in relation to Sally Hughes, who's the independent for independence candidate who's standing against Pete Wisher. Um, who's also been, I think he's actually Scotland's longest serving MP and obviously he's also SNP. But there is a concern that he may not be a proponent of independence either because he's the guy that boasts about the length of time that he's been there, made a joke he said about wanting to become the speaker and now and again there's been comments in relation to whether the SNP would ever take up a seat in the House of Lords. So people like Sally and me and Derek Kerr who's an independence for independent candidate against Tommy Shepherd in Edinburgh we want independence. We're not splitting a vote. We're looking to get the vote. But in the real world, if you look at the statistics, Scotland will elect 57 MPs to Westminster. If 29 of those MPs, 29 of them, are standing on an independence ticket, 
those 29 elected MPs will have a majority of the Scottish seats. They should also have a majority of the popular vote. And these two matters combine give international legitimacy to the demand then to be able to negotiate the terms of the independence settlement with the British government. And that's my aim and that's what I'm determined to see delivered. And I know that's what the other independence candidates think. Now, there are people in the SNP and there are some in ALBA and some in the ISP who also favour independence and who agree with me. So the answer for the electorate is to make damn sure that they're voting for somebody who is determined to deliver independence and that way it will happen. What they ought not to do is to vote for the same old whose feet have been under the Westminster table for too long, who've been living high on the hog and who've forgotten who put them down there and why they were sent there in the first place. So I want to be the last MP elected for Alloa and Grangemouth and I'm determined that I will be because I am absolutely determined that this is going to be the independence election and it's high time that the SNP and others within the movement woke up to what the people of Scotland A, need and B, deserve. Okay. Uh, Roddy's giving you a wee clap there just to, just to let you know. Um, okay, so is this even the beginning of a process like the reinvigoration of the SNP was in the in the mid to late 90s? Is this the beginning of a process that's going to take time or do you envisage that there will be a snowball effect here that will bring about a sudden acknowledgement and, and uh, permission, to, I hate to use that word, but permission to have a referendum? Um, or is this a long journey that you're beginning in a way again by setting out a new party with ALBA, uh, independence coming out. Is, is this the beginning of a new process or can this snowball? I think we're quite, quite far down the road already because the results literally on the doors going around canvassing and leafleting, speaking to people is not unlike the political tsunami, if you want to call it that, that happened with George Galloway's recent election because obviously he was elected as an independent but the runner-up was also independent because what we're finding really across the board is most of the general public are absolutely sick to the back teeth of party politics and they welcome independent candidates, particularly if they have a strong local connection. So I, I think that this has the potential to actually be a very quick and swift process, provided that the right people stand in the right places and we have party politicians who understand that it's time for change it's not time for any more of the same old um, where we're promised, you know, vote for me and it'll be jammed tomorrow, but tomorrow never comes, um, as has been the case for most of the SNP, as we've already said. So it has the ability to change things. What would change it most, though, would be if Hamza Youssef, to divert attention from all the gaffes and the errors that he's made, if he would just set up the Constitutional Convention at the weekend. He's having an event, um, I think, on Saturday, I am called Believe in Scotland. He could follow that event up with invitations to party and independent leaders and civic leaders to just get the convention on the road, get the show on the road, get it up and running. Let's start talking about how to deliver independence. Get a strategy that the entire movement can unite behind. Uh, Lloyd, in terms of the potential for and this is coming from a member of the SNP. I'm just sorry to rub that in again, but uh, the potential for the likes of Eva, uh, for other independents, for the Alba Party to really uh, take the bull by the horns in the upcoming two elections that are going to be happening in the near future. What potential do you see? Do you see a long process, or do you see a snowball effect? I think it, it's one of these circumstances that it's 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 not possible to to make accurate prediction. But what I, I I would agree with Eva in as much as there is a sea change amongst the electorate. I don't think there's any question about that. That's been that's been shown by a number of by elections that have happened at a local council level as well. Uh, what we're seeing is a kind of double whammy. There is a a, a collapse in the Scottish National Party's vote, but there's also a collapse in turnout. And that, I think, is that plays more for the independents than it does for, for the parties. I think we're lucky 
in as much as the three people who so far have declared that they're going to be standing are of a very high quality, which is uh, can't be said for every single candidate that the, the, the political parties will put up. And I think that's in their favour. But I also think the sense of disconnect, which, you know, if you, if you were seeing our newspapers and our six o'clock news every day over the past week, it has been disaster after disaster after disaster for the Scottish National Party followed quite closely by disaster after disaster after disaster for the Labour Party in Scotland as well, because in a bizarre way, the Labour Party in Scotland has actually tied its, its, itself to the coattails of a couple of, of really, really poor policies. I mean, poor in the reception from the, the electorate that the SNP have. So, you know, there's a difficulty there. But the winner at the moment in terms of the, the opinion polls is the vast majority of people support independence but around about a third of them simply will not vote. And they've stated clearly now they won't vote. Our job, I think, or not necessarily our job, but the job of particularly the independents, Indy First and the, the movement in general, is to mobilise people to actually go out and vote, particularly if you've got an independent candidate to vote for. But at the same time, we need to, we need to introduce a new game in this British plebiscite. Uh, and that comes in the form of a, a campaign called Not My Parliament which is not a, I'm sitting in the house, I'm not going to the polling station, not my parliament. This is this is a campaign for an active. Now, some people would call it spoiling the ballot paper. I don't call it spoiling the ballot paper. I call it an active democratic act to go to get your ballot paper and to write on it, not my parliament, stating very clearly in that statement that you support independence and you believe that Scotland should have its own its own parliament, fully sovereign, and that we should be members of the United Nations. I don't think this can be quick. I think part of the, the central problem that the Scottish national movement, as opposed to national movements in other places, is that by tying themselves to the rules of the British state and the British electoral cycle uh, and operating within those rules, and I'm not suggesting that anyone need break the rules, but you can bend them and you can bend them to the point of breaking them while at the same time delivering good governance. The problem is that the Scottish National Party and the movement in general has always seen it as a badge of honour to operate within the system. And that, for me, right from the day I joined the party, I've believed is a mistake. And I believe now, post-2014, we, no, we, we can no longer simply play along to the, the, the rules as laid down by the British. We need to start saying to ourselves, who are we? What do we want and how do we get it? And we have to lay the plan out. The problem is we have a political class. And, and you know, it's interesting. I'd, I'd like to know what you think about this, Finbar, but we're only 25 years into having a Scottish Parliament to effectively having a national polity as opposed to a UK-wide polity. And in that time, because we have aped and copied the British, all we've successfully done, and this is what's destroyed the Scottish National Party, is we've created an elite political class in a very short period of time. The vast majority of the SNP members of the current Scottish Parliament, in 1999, they were either at school or they were working for a member of the Scottish Parliament. Now, if you have internal promotion in politics from the guy who makes the tea to being a minister eight or nine years later, then you're on the wrong road. You really are. You are not exploiting what you need to exploit to have good governance, which is to be able to tap into all the talents in your population. Now, the great thing about being a liberation movement is you can do all that work before you need to do it when you're in government, but that work has not been done. Everything has been done within a timetable dictated by Westminster, and within Westminster's rules. And at no point, as you know, was proved in 1919, if you want to change, you can use the rules up to a point, which Sinn Féin did. But when it came to the crucial point of whether or not they would go to Westminster or the Doyle would be restructured or would be, would be recreated, what did they do? They recreated the Doyle. And as a result of that, by breaking the rules in that manner, what they did was allowed a sequence of events to come. Now, until the Scottish National Party, separate from the movement, understands that it cannot work exclusively within the British rules and expect in any way to achieve its aims, then 
they're just plain wrong, as the past 25 years of the Scottish Parliament proves to us. Devolution is dead. It's time to make the next step, or we'll have another 25 years of zombie living and 25% of our children living in poverty and 30% of our pensioners living in poverty, and those numbers are only going to get worse. We need change. I couldn't predict. Quick or slow is not the issue. It's putting the structures in place to deliver, to have the plan, to have the imagination. At the moment, we're in limbo where there is no plan, there is no imagination within the, the political parties, out with in the movement, there are plenty of plans and there are plenty of imagination. Isn't yeah. there, uh, I'm not, I won't say it's natural, but there has been a pattern of nation states relinquishing uh, the power that Britain has and London has over them. And those states just adopting the same exact same systems, they'll get rid of the pledge to the king or the pledge to the queen, but adopting the same legal system, the same economic systems, and nothing really changes. And I think that's what you're reflecting there, Lloyd, as well. But on the other hand, to build up a Scottish independence movement by its very nature means building up a grassroots democracy that is not reflective or is not modelled on the democracy that, that we allegedly have in the UK and Ireland. And I think a lot of that work has been done uh, Roddy, you are still heavily, you're all involved in that work, but you were part of a project or, or a travelling show of sorts that went around Scotland recently, uh, bringing the message into communities and having open discussions in communities. How did that go? How did people respond to it? And what feedback did you get in terms of uh, the type of Scotland that people want? Well, yeah, it was fantastic. We did, um, uh, it was a, through a Scottish Prison Road show. And we did that. Uh, we went to, uh, we started off in uh, the city of Discovery, Dundee. We did. Dum we went to Dunfermline. Um, we went to Aberdeen and we went to Perth. And uh, the great crowds. And what the thing was, we, we went in with no agenda and uh, we asked for questions from the floor. Did I say a wee bit like question time, except without a selected audience? Um, uh, so they, the questions were coming from the floor. And they were none, none. I, I really can't think of any of the questions we're asking. There wasn't one question that said, "Well, will I be financially better off?" They were about the, the questions that were about poverty, about our natural resources, about our democracy, um, and it was fantastic. The feedback, and also the feedback that, that came through again was that the people have lost faith in the political parties. I mean, as we've all alluded to, I mean, the, the recent polls showed something like 53% want independence, uh, only 31% want to vote for the SNP, 2% for the Alipa party, which means you've got 20%, you know, one fifth of the people who believe in independence are going to sit at home because they've lost faith in the political parties. And that came across very clearly. And people like Eva, who were on that, was on that tour with me, and Sally, who's another one of the candidates for Perth and Kinrosha, you know, they were lauded and uh, applauded and uh, the, the public are right behind them. What feeling did you get from the roadshow, Eva? I thoroughly enjoyed it, but I know that what the audiences all find very frustrating is that the Scottish Government and the SNP obviously do not currently have a roadmap to independence that is one that people feel comfortable with because there is no process outlined by them and that is what I think the majority of the population want to see and that's where independent candidates can score or it's where for example the Alba party can score by actually pointing out all the time as often as is necessary what the individual steps to be taken are so the audiences want to know how do you create a constitutional convention who would sit on it and why? What would its powers be? What would its functions be? What would its purpose be? Um, what does it mean to create links with the international community? How important are those? What would an application to the UN involve? Why would we go to the International Court of Justice? What is Scottish sovereignty? What's the difference between Scottish sovereignty and Westminster sovereignty? Well, in Scotland, the people are sovereign, not the monarch, not the government, but the people. So these um, areas are wide open for debate and the public is very, very thirsty for knowledge and for elected politicians who will actually deliver something as opposed to making 
false promises and people are stuck yet again. I mean, the worst possible thing that could happen at the Westminster election would be if the SNP had a majority of seats, because that will not lead to progress for Scotland. It will not create a Section 30 and a request for a referendum, because we know that's not going to happen. It is not likely that a majority of SNP MPs will do anything other than what they've consistently and persistently done since Alex Salmond stood down in 2014, and it's settled down. It's making speeches like Tommy Shepherd, who said, we'll be good little parliamentarians. Mm -hmm. And what it feels like is that the independence word, that very word, is only ever used by the SNP when there's an election in the offing or when some other politician from a different party has mentioned it. It's not used because they mean it anymore. So in terms of the Scottish independence movement, yes, there's vibrancy there and there's imagination there, but they need to be led or the people will lead the politicians. And I think that that is something that's going to be happening more and more in future. Um, I don't just mean in terms of mass displays like um, rallies and matches and what have you, but there are, there are a lot of people in Scotland within the movement who are writing to their MPs, their MSPs, constantly now pointing out everything that's wrong with the way that the, the Scottish independence politicians currently behaving and there will come a time when there will be a day of reckoning and if it isn't this Westminster election I'm sure it will be the next Holyrood election and there'll be a lot of people who fail to deliver who will be out on their ears Can I just, uh, this is the final question I want to put to each one of you it's abstract at the moment but may not be into the, into the future will London ever let Scotland go referendum or no will there ever come a day after a positive referendum result, that you'll finally be able to say, yes, we c cut all those shackles, we are truly independent. Will Scotland ever be truly independent from London or will London let us go? And if you think they may try not to, how far would they go to stop Scotland post-referendum, a positive referendum from getting true independence? And we'll start off with Lloyd on that. Well, number one, I wouldn't go down the referendum road. When I when I joined the Scottish National Party, it said the first line in my membership card, with a majority of seats and a majority of votes, we will trigger and begin negotiations for our independence. And that was that was that was a party constitution up until just before the creation of the Scottish Parliament in 1997. And the individual who made that change is probably one of the people who's not on our side, but he's still in the Scottish National Party. London does not have the ability to stop us. If the people, if the people want it, and they're properly led, and it's facilitated for the people to deliver, and that should be in an electoral event where people mark their cross. We don't go to the oppressor and ask the oppressor if we if we can give them a second chance to stop us. That's why I thought the referendum, apart from giving us the opportunity to run an education campaign for a year and the run up to the referendum, I felt it was folly. I thought it was folly. We were oppor giving, giving, giving the UK the, the opportunity to block us when in actual fact we should have just kept going for the majority. But I've been asked this question over the years, Finbar, but not by people from Ireland. This is a question that used to come up on the doorstep as, a, as an SNP canvasser, as an, an pro-independence activist on a regular basis. And it shows you just how colonised our people have become when they actually think to themselves, London can stop us. How can they stop you? I mean, are, are, you know, some people say, oh, they've got the army. The army, if the war broke out in the south, in the north again, they wouldn't be able to contain it in any way whatsoever. The British army it exists on paper. And that's not the way it would work anyway. Our bigger issue is not whether London will let us go. It's whether or not NATO in Brussels will let us go. Will America allow us to do what Ireland is currently under pressure to do, which is to go into the, the NATO club? Will they allow Scotland to strategically, in terms of that North Atlantic gap, and these things that you have to deal with, you have to talk about these things. You can't, you can't pretend they don't exist in the same way as most British politicians will say to you, well, I don't know anything about Irish politics. And they're not talking about the politics of the Republic. They're talking about the North. Unfortunately, they tend to forget that the North is actually part of the United Kingdom. And anyone in British politics that doesn't understand the politics of the North 
doesn't understand British politics. It's as simple as that. Our, our problem is finding the manner in which we can mobilise our people to deliver. Because the people in a majority cannot be stopped. If 60% of the people of this country or 55% of the people of this country make a democratic act in favour of our independence, there is not a lot Britain could do. But by the same token, and this is probably the principal reason there's so much resistance to independence from Britain and its allies, if you take the Scottish economy and all that the Scottish economy provides for Britain out of the British economy, it becomes Algeria overnight. That's the damage that You don't Britain think that leaving. could go as far as the Spanish government reaction to the Basque movement, for instance? Do you, you, you don't... I think given that we've never had a circumstance, or rather there were, there were manufactured attempts at creating pretend armed resistance against the UK in the 1970s and 80s, all of which turned out to be projects of the British themselves, right? That's not going to happen. It's not... There's no requirement for it. I mean, it's a Come straightforwardly thing, but you, you, you transfer the fifth, you, you take the 53% that currently say they support independence. You, 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 you have a day in six months when they can exercise that right to tell the world that they support independence. That 53% will be 60. And at the point you have 60% of your population saying this, this deal, because remember, it's a treaty. This treaty no longer serves the purpose that it served in 1707. We are out of here. What we will come under pressure for is to remain in NATO, to not nationalise our oil, not nationalise any of our, our, our natural resources, and to give Britain and America free reign to run naval bases and air force bases on our territory. Those are the things we will come under pressure for. And it's how far they're prepared to go. But in reality, a mobilised 60% cannot be defeated. It cannot. If anything, what would you do? Create a, a, a system of constant and, and turmoil for, for a decade? I'm taking up too much time here. That, that's the way I see it. But I just, I just, what's in my mind really is, not necessarily the Basque example, it might have been bad, but the Catalonian example, uh, mm -hmm. where the, you know there was a referendum, it was clear that the majority of people in Catalonia were in support, and yet the riot police were taken out, police and what looked really like paramilitary forces from Madrid uh, were taken into Catalonia. And there was terrible scenes. Leaders were, were sent into exile or under a threat of arrest. The EU system itself was abused. Roddy, how far do you think and how low do you think London would go to keep Scotland? Well, they're not going to like it. They'll do everything they can, you know, they'll try and undermine whatever plebiscite or election folk we, we're doing. But we are not Catalonia. I mean, I live in Catalonia. I was there when the, when the, the vote was going on. They don't have a paramilitary um, force that they could send up to Scotland. And it would also be the worst thing possible they could possibly do, because that would take the 60% to 70, 75%. Um, it would just, you, you don't, you know, the Scots would not tolerate it. You know, on the day they might win, but the, the day that a, a British soldier's foot steps onto the soil of, to, to, to enforce the will of London, it's over. You know, it's, it's a matter of time thereafter. So I don't think, uh, again, whether they have the people to do it or not, I do not know. 28% of the army, for example, are Scots. Um, so, uh, you know, and there's another 20% are from the Commonwealth, but the 28% Scots, you know, what are they going to do with them? They're going to have to send them to the furthest part of the world. So, no, I don't think they'll get to violence. They will try all their underhand tricks, the MI6, or, I mean, we know what the, the, the games they get up to. But I, I, I'm, with, I'm with Lloyd in this. I believe once we have the, the votes in the ballot box and international opinion behind us, and we have a lot of friends, and I would say this, Finbar, I would expect Ireland to be the first country to recognise us when that vote is done. I'd be very disappointed if the French beat you to it. Um, <laughs> I'm sure the um, Irish so... people, the Irish people would recognise you, but the problem is our politicians can't be trusted on matters such as that. Eva, how far do you think they'll go? How low will they go? Right. Um, I'll tell you a story. Right. International recognition is vital, and we'll get international recognition when we have that democratic electoral event where there is an overwhelming majority 
of elected MPs or MSPs and the popular vote. However, the first time I visited Ireland was in 1995 and I had a court action in the four courts in Dublin and had the great privilege of my client being represented by an advocate, a barrister called Justin Dillon, who had previously been a diplomat. And we'd an Irish solicitor called Raymond Finucane. And these two men showed me around the four courts, told me a lot about Irish history that I had not previously known. And what I found unforgettable was the national pride that the two of them had in being able to speak about Ireland's independence and where Ireland was going and Ireland going places. And you and I know that between 1995 and now, whilst Ireland has not been without its difficulties, the real impact in, in Ireland itself of the peace process and everything that has followed on from that has meant that there is a degree of prosperity in Ireland that was long overdue. But I think a lot of that comes from a feeling of pride. And my own view is that when the Scots vote for independence, which they will, and I hope they do it soon, because that's going to be a vote of 55 or 60% or whatever it is, I don't just think that Ireland will be the first to recognise us and to support us and congratulate us, but I also think that the Irish and the French and very many other nations and countries around the world will be making it very plain to the British. This has been a democratic election. You cannot undermine the democracy and the power of the people of a country because we're not Catalonia and we're not even Ireland. Scotland was an independent nation. Independence is normal. And all that we will do when we vote for our independence is restore that position, which has been a Scottish tradition. And as I referred to earlier, the people are sovereign, not, not the monarch, not the Westminster government, but the people. So I don't want a British soldier to set foot in Scottish soil. I want quite the opposite. But what I want the British government to know is that people like me and Lloyd and Roddy and thousands of others are determined when we say there will be a democratic event, we will vote for independence and we will have it, no matter what the attitude of the Westminster Brits might be. Okay, You're running yeah, into yeah. Westminster elections, Eva. Uh, what date are they on? It's not been called yet, so there's a view that it could be October, November time. Um, that looks likely at the moment. Um, so hopefully there'll be plenty of us elected and come Hogmanay, we'll be singing Old Lang Syne in a Scotland that's almost independent. Yeah, yeah. Com Comrie, can I thank you for coming on today? Can I wish you the best of luck in the elections? And hopefully we'll be talking to you, if not before, certainly soon after those elections. Thank you. Lloyd Quinnan, thanks for joining us again. I'm off and on through a Scottish prison, which I would recommend to anybody and everybody to watch. I, I'm off and on talking about the Ukraine situation and with Roddy and I'm with Lloyd. And I have to say that they're great hosts and they're great to interact with as well. Have a look at Through a Scottish Prism. And Roddy, I don't have to say it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you. That's all we have to say. Listen, guys, we're going to wrap up for now. We will be speaking to you, hopefully, individually and as a group into the near future again as the campaign is building. Folks at home, thanks for tuning in. We'll speak to you soon again.